It's time to talk a little aftermath of El Clasico, uh, one of the biggest games in the world happened as we know this weekend and uh, boy what a game it was. So we have went straight to the source, we want to bring in uh, some of the lads from over in Madrid to discuss what went wrong with their team. So we've got Vitaly here from Real Galacticos, thank you for joining us Vitaly. So the first thing is first, how is your recovery going? What is, uh, what is the, your thought process after that game of the weekend? Well, uh, I was really devastated on Saturday, kind of uh, assimilating it on, on Sunday. And now it's Monday, you know, we have to look ahead. That's the only way. We can't dwell in this forever. But I think to talk about the game and what went wrong, I have to agree with you what we, with what you said in the tactical video uh, before the game and how important Casemiro would be. And I think that was Benitez's uh, biggest sin, not playing Casemiro that day. Pundits who are being paid thousands upon thousands of dollars on TV saying that it was a great team selection for Real Madrid. And I was shocked because, yes, maybe on paper it looks attractive when you have Modric, Cruz and James in your midfield. But when you're trying to play against a team like Barcelona, it seems like Real Madrid were trying to fight fire with fire rather than being smart and, and playing a player who would easily cover that position. But um, what was the fans' perspective with this? When you were uh, looking at the Real Madrid fans, were they disappointed in Rafa Benitez or do you think they're more disappointed in the players? I personally and most of the people I talked to were more disappointed in the players than in Rafa Benitez. It is true that Rafa Benitez was not faithful to his principles and maybe that was again his biggest mistake because I think he wanted to play Casemiro and then he went with the lineup that maybe, you know, the press was asking for or a, a big part of the fans because, as you said, it looks nice on paper, but these guys were not fit to tactically play the game Benitez needed them to play, yeah. especially pressuring Barcelona uh, up top or, you know, making it difficult for them to control or move the ball around. These guys are the guys that on paper... And don't get me wrong here. I think, I think this is the lineup that Benitez wants working. Yeah. But when the players are fit and in the pace of the game, and that was not the case on, on Saturday. So evidently, you know, the lack of Casemiro, it, it, le it left Modric and Cruz very alone yeah. in that midfield. So when they went up for the pressure, you know, our team was broken in two. You could see in many, many moments of the game, you can see like five or six people creating that first line of pressure. But, you know, we know that Barcelona doesn't have, you know, they don't have much difficulties getting through that line. Yeah. And then it was an open field in the midfield for them to move the ball around and look for that space. And yeah, that was spot on there. And as you mentioned, sometimes when the, the, the El Clasico happens, you often see Madrid fans specifically uh, playing against Barcelona when they've got talent on show as they do actually congratulate and, and just kind of pay tribute to how good of a team Barcelona can be. Same way it works back and forth. We remember the infamous game in which uh, Real Madrid fans gave Ronaldinho a standing ovation. It seemed like they were almost paying tribute to Iniesta in this game because he had such a fantastic game. So from that side of it, do you think the fans were kind of thinking, OK, Barcelona were just too good? Or do you think they were thinking we could have played so much better? I think it's the second, the second thing you just said. Uh, definitely... You know, it's because we are pissed to see uh, or we are angry to see our, our team play like that. And then we're looking at, at more creative ways of, of, let's say, of expressing that anger. And, you know, maybe cheering or, you know, giving a standing ovation to a Barcelona player uh, is, is one of those ways. Um, on the other hand, I have to say with Andres Iniesta is a very specific thing because, you know, He's not Ronaldinho. He, he's, let's say, well, he's from Barcelona, but he's a Spanish guy. Yeah. And he scored that goal that gave Spain the World Cup in 2010. So I remember after that season, he was being, he was receiving an, a, stand, a standing ovation in every, every stadium in Spain. Yeah. So that kind of, you know, came together. And I think it was very, uh, yeah, it, it was well deserved. He played an amazing game. So yeah, when we're talking about the game, it, it, it often seems that the media has such a strong influence on El Clasico as a whole, and I think they are fully taking advantage of the result uh, by by speculating and, and and just saying things that I think people want to hear worldwide, but I don't necessarily think it is the case in Madrid, like saying that Ronaldo now wants to leave, that PSG uh, is a team that he maybe will want to go to, Gareth Bale hasn't ruled out 
a move back to the Premier League. He stated that before, but suddenly that's then turned around to be a sign that he wants to leave after El Clasico. I think, before I jump into your response, I, I have to say that this is just standard me media work right here. This is them trying to get people to buy their newspapers, to ch click on their websites by making it seem that there is turmoil in Real Madrid. I mean, before the game against Sevilla, People were saying that Real Madrid have looked stronger than ever. Defensively, they look great. Winning games, draw, playing well. And then they go and they lose against Sevilla, which I understand. And then Barcelona outclass them with some poor managerial decisions. And suddenly, everything the shit hits the fan. And they're saying that everyone wants to depart. And, uh, and now two of their best players are considering moving elsewhere. So what do you think, Vidali? Looking at this from a Madrid fan, do you believe any of these rumours? Do you see Ronaldo and Bale moving? Or do you think the media are just capitalising on the old classical result? There is some truth to what the media are saying because uh, there are some, um, let's say, uh, tight relations between some of the players and, and some of the people who write for these media. So some of the information that's been filtered is actually coming from the dressing room. It's, it's not just, you know, uh, pipe dreams of, of, of journalists. Some of these things are true. Now, it is true that before losing to Sevilla, you know, we had good numbers, but we, we, we didn't have the feeling that we were a solid team and we were playing well. Mm -hmm. It was Benitez kind of being defensive about, about these accusations, hiding behind the numbers that were good. But it, it's been a while since the sensation that we were, you know, playing good football. Um, so I think this last two weeks just kind of put everything in the spotlight. And some of the problems that some of the fans, especially the fans, we expected that would not affect our performance on the pitch. Now we can see that it is actually affecting it. And, and to me, to me the, the, the people who I blame is really, number one, the players. Yeah. I don't want to hear about, you know, this is the president, bad managerial decisions or the coach. It is true that the coach could have, you know, could have played this game better. But in the end, who played the game were the players and who showed that they're not committed maybe to the coach, maybe to the project, were the players. And that's what we saw on the pitch. That's what got Real Madrid fans really angry, I think. Well, finally, on this note, before we look forward to the, the game in the Champions League, Ronaldo, whenever uh, towards the end of the game, it seemed that the fans were booing him when he was in possession of the ball. What did you make of that? Do you think that that was a uh, Real Madrid fans having a little too short of a memory? Or do you think it was worthy of, of, of the boos? Uh, I think it's, it's, it's the two things. Yeah. It, it is true that, you know, having a short memory because of all he has achieved and all he has done for the club. But at some point, if he stops doing it, you know, his credit is not going to be eternal. Yeah. You know, what you did, you already did. And thank you so much for doing it. And there's also, I think, uh, some anger because there's this rumor. I don't know how much of it is true, but I wouldn't be surprised if it were. Uh, apparently, Ronaldo at halftime stormed in the dressing room uh, sh just shouting or, or claiming that it was either Benitez or him. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Um, and, you know, this behavior is kind of spoiled kid behavior in, in, the, in the, how to say, in the, in the wrongest or in the most wrong time possible. Like at halftime, when you're having a very complicated game, uh, if you want to do that, do it after or before, but not at halftime. Where, like you, you can actually still come back. Yeah. I mean, we saw in the fifth, the first five minutes of the second half that Real Madrid could have turned it around, but you know, our behaviors like that that get the fans angry. Uh, that got me angry. Like you know, Ronaldo, thank you so much for everything, but if this is how you're going to be behaving from now on, you better leave. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like it, it, this has happened before with certain players, and I do agree that the legacy cannot live on forever. I think Ronaldo is that type of player that um, he can influence a game so easily uh, with his ability. So when you see him get frustrated, like he does get frustrated so clearly in the game, it's almost as if it's not going to lift those around him. And I think that's part of his game, which is always something that's kind of hindered them. But let's just finish on this note. So uh, a game in the Champions League this week that I think before El Clasico, I don't think it would have been looked at as such a vital game for Madrid because they're performing so well in the Champions League. But now, after the result, how big of a game is this on Wednesday? Do you think that Madrid really need to pull off a convincing win? I think we do. We need to pull off a convincing win. But this is a double-edged kind of game for us because, as you were saying, maybe the press wants to capitalize on everything. So if we lose this game, it'll be like, oh, okay, it's a disaster. We hadn't lost three games in a row in so long and so long. But if we win it, It'll be like, oh, yeah, this is this is a small team. 
So this victory yeah. doesn't really count because the, the problems were in, in the big team, again, in the big game against Barcelona. Yeah. I don't know if, if I'm making my, my, myself clear, but no, I, you know, I think it's, it's that double edge. If we, if we lose, it'll be a total disaster and yeah. this will be the end of everyone. But if we win, this whole aftershock of the Clásico will still continue. Yeah, uh, and that's kind of that comes part and parcel with it being the biggest game in the world. I think everyone likes to talk about it. So uh, thank you so much, Vitaly, for coming on. Stay tuned. We'll be discussing more things here uh, surrounding the world of European football. We're actually going to choose our best starting eleven cohesively. Myself, Vitaly, and the True Jordi are going to discuss our best starting eleven from European football based on form at the moment. So you might not even see. Lionel Messi in there or Ronaldo. Could it be the first time ever that that happened? Make sure to check out Real Galactico's YouTube channel. Awesome channel over there. Uh, a lot of great discussions concerning Real Madrid and everything around one of the world's biggest clubs. Come back again to UIT Sports. Subscribe.